just still, I'm just laughing at the fact that his so-called friends <laughs> were more of anemones. Yeah, <laughs> it was very comical. Yeah. <laughs> well, not to Job. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Well, I mean, but, but just no, I know what you mean. Them, it's like anything else. Um, I feel like you really have to study Job, like we are, mm -hmm. to fully understand it. Because if you just read over it, it just you don't really get the full meaning of it. No. You know what I mean? And then um, there was one other thing I. Kind can't remember what it is now. Okay. Well, uh, if, do you have any questions about anything that we've gone over before we go with this? No? Okay. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to look at the third discourse between the friends. We're not going to look at a whole lot because most of this stuff we've already covered. Right. Um, so I'm just going to pick out a few things here and there. That's why I'm not, really not concerned that we're starting this late. Um, so first off, uh, let's t briefly talk about God and the idea of justice. God doesn't act the same in every situation. That's the first problem that people don't understand with his justice. We think more of how, you know, okay, well, if something's wrong, then you correct it. Like if a child's doing something wrong, you get them in trouble for it. Yeah. But God doesn't always act the same way. He's not predictable in any given circumstance. Even if two people are doing the exact same thing, he might deal with both of them differently. See what I mean? So you have this problem of it's not that God is unjust. It's just that he acts unique in every situation. And... We have the bigger problem that God doesn't act in the same time frame as people think. Um, and also he never changes, which is a whole other thing, and he never acts against his character. Right. We've looked at that before, though. God didn't do this to Job. Satan did. That's actually a pretty important point. It might seem minor, but it actually is pretty important. And in fact, we can even push that a little bit further. Satan really didn't do a lot of the things. He enticed people to do it. Yeah. Who was it who came and stole Job's camels? Well, did Satan come? Did no. Satan appear? And, and no, no, the Scythians and these other people were doing all these different things. Right. Just, so you, technically, at the broadest okay. aspect of it, people were doing the evil. Right. And Satan was inciting them, and God was allowing it. Right. So you've got this like kind of like chain of command thing going on, right. where it's kind of okay. What's the difference between allowing something to happen and causing it to happen? Well, that's a whole big discussion that. Right. Like I say, the the wisdom books are meant to be pondered. Not really, they're not really meant to be books that you just get quick, easy answers from. Um, so God al and God allowed it to happen, but He will bring punishment to those who did the wrong thing. This brings us back to last week where I mentioned about um, God having um, giving free will. Um, people also did some of it. Sorry, I already mentioned that. Okay. Um, Job's crying out was not the end of the matter, nor was death. It was the beginning. What, what Job failed to understand throughout the whole book, really, is that ju his, he temporarily was not seeing justice in the situation. And in fact, at the end of the book, if you look, it's questionable if he ever actually saw justice happen. Right. The people who, who for instance, stole his, stole his camels and stole, stole all of his stuff, does it ever say that they were, no. that they were discovered yeah. and his property was restored? No, he says no. that he got more. Right. So I mean, there's a big difference there. Yeah. So there's a possibility that these people who did these evil things got off scot-free. Exactly. And his yeah. three friends, who kind of did give him the shaft. Right. Uh, let's be honest here. Um, he had to pray for them, and they got off scot-free too. Yeah. And as we read through Job, that's actually one of the things that kind of surfaces. Is at the beginning, it's kind of Job with all these things cosmically happening that are unfair to Job. But then the shift kind of changes, and the the suffering of the righteous person is actually suffering the evil friends, and Job's friends are put into the place of the persecutor, put in the place of the wicked, put in the place of Satan's instrument. So you have this complete shift of these people who were originally going to help him switching roles with Satan and being used by Satan to tear him down. Mm -hmm. It's just a very odd uh, thing because if you notice, Satan really doesn't focus any more in the book. No, we're done with him. Right. He was in the first two chapters, and yeah, then, that, 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 from there on out, the people being used by Satan are the only people mentioned again, right. which, you know, would be, for instance, Job's friends. friends yeah. So, um, what Job felt to understand is that his problems were not the end of the matter, which brings an, another important point with justice. Things aren't always what they seem. Yeah. Sometimes we think, oh, they got away scot-free, but they really didn't. Yeah. And uh, so just, uh, there's a lot of different things there. 
we might not see justice on earth. That's just a fact of, of living on life. Uh, justice on earth is hollow either way. Think about this. It's a temporary solution based on actions, okay? How does a killing how does killing a killer ultimately solve anything? Nothing. See what I mean? If somebody kills somebody and you kill them, you just that didn't really resolve an issue. It just simply brought punishment for the issue. Right. You see the you see the difference? There was nothing resolved through that problem. Um, how does arresting a killer solve anything? So somebody kills somebody and you arrest him, how does that bring back the person they killed? Nothing. How does that right the wrong that has been done? Like, it doesn't. It doesn't right the wrong. Even when you kill a murderer, it doesn't right the wrong. It simply carries justice out on the person who acted unjustly. Right. That's all that it does. So death is not the biggest issue. And like I say, human justice either way is pretty hollow. Because remember, let's say – let me let me throw a hypothetical at you. A 70-year-old man kills somebody. And the next year, unbeknownst to anybody else, he di he's going to die of natural causes anyways. Right. So let's say you put him on the wait list to be oh, to be broken. killed by the state. And let's say it takes two to three years for, for him to actually oh, be given the, yeah. the, the – you know, to be actually be put under. Well, so that would mean he would die of natural causes before the state even got to him. Right. You see what I'm saying? Our t we're all going to die anyways. Yeah, how does taking away a temporary blessing such as life ultimately resolve the issue? And my point in this is, is very, very simple. Our idea of justice I don't really think is exactly what God's idea of justice is. He has this whole big cosmic thing going on, and we see such a small picture, and we think, oh, this is so unfair, but the truth is this is so temporary right. and small and almost meaningless. Right. Not meaningless, but, but, but compared to eternity, it's pretty small, and we make it pretty big. Right. So that's all that I'm really trying to get across there. That we blow, I'm blow not trying – right, blow it out of proportion. I am not trying to say that we shouldn't have justice in the world. I'm not trying to say we shouldn't right the wrongs. I'm not saying that at all. Um, so the wicked will suffer, but that shouldn't make us happy. That brings us to a whole other thing, which we don't have time to look at in the study of Job. That's something you look at more in the New Testament. If nothing ever happened, nothing would ever change. That's just a fact of justice anyways. And some people say the same thing with health problems. It's your own fault. Have you ever have you ever done something like that? Somebody's experiencing health problems, and you say, "Well, it's your own fault if you just take care of your body." Now, I'm not saying that, that you're wrong in, in that statement. That might be true. I mean, for instance, you can't eat McDonald's every single day, and then, oh, surprise, surprise, my heart's failing. <laughs> like the, that's gonna happen. Like, right. but that doesn't mean that you have to rub it in. Oh yeah. See, I mean, what Job said: if it was our role switched, I would be comforting you. Right. Remember that when yeah. somebody does some, even if somebody does do something stupid and they're suffering for their own mistake. Is that actually what we're called to do is just hump on somebody's you know, uh, failures? So um, remember that if nothing ever happened, nothing would ever change. Sometimes we think, oh, this is so unjust. Sometimes going through un injustice is how God brings about a greater justice. Don't forget those things. It's not all about what we're seeing right now. So a real brief, brief recap, recap of chapters 22 through 31. Most of it is Job talking. Very little of this is, is his friends. So in chapter 22, it's Eliphaz. Sins, um, God doesn't punish goodness, but evil you send. Oh, I'm sorry, that's supposed to say since. I was thinking, why does it say that? It's not supposed to say sins, it's supposed to say since. Since God doesn't punish goodness, but evil you send. It runs again, regurgitating the same nonsense over and over again. And uh, Job, death is a great equalizer. He almost starts to get more detached as we go along. But you'll see that after Bildad gives his second response here in a minute, it's almost like he gets a renewed energy right. to prove himself right. And so he goes on this lengthy discourse to prove himself right, and finally it works, and the three friends stop talking. Finally! finally. But he has to, like, finally, get, I guess, get pissed off enough or something. Yes. I don't know. So then that brings us to chapter 25. This is where Bildad gives his final speech. You can't be righteous. That's basically what he's saying. You can't be righteous. It is an impossibility for you to be righteous, which I understand what he's saying, but that doesn't remove the fact that he was blameless and he didn't do anything to deserve his circumstances. So it's kind of just circumnavigating the issue. It's not It's not really relevant to what we're talking about. And obviously this is what catapults Job into his final thing of trying to prove himself. And if you notice, um, Zophar doesn't give a third speech. Uh -huh. I think that Job was so enthusiastic with this response that just shut him up too. Right. Which I think is like a miracle because that guy was mean with some of his responses like, geez, guy. 
This is the guy that in the first round of speeches tried to usher everybody to give more attacks against Job because we shouldn't let this stand, even though they hadn't let it stand at all. Um, so I did nothing wrong, but God is mighty and the wicked will suffer. So he, he does kind of acknowledge a few things that they had been saying, but he kind of adds his own little spin to it too. Right. Like, yeah, you're partly right, but this is how you're wrong, and this is how you what you should actually believe. For chapter 28, it almost seems like it doesn't fit because it's kind of in between these two dialogues. And 26 to 27, he's kind of more or less addressing his friends. In 28, he's not really addressing his friends. He's more talking about wisdom. As, as an idea, and he goes back in 29 through 31, talking once again about, I had done nothing wrong. And he actually goes through a lengthy, lengthy discourse about this. Chapter 29, he starts out with saying, you know, uh, this is how things used to be. And then I think it's into like, I think it's chapter 30. He says, okay, now this, this is how things are now. And then he goes into chapter 31 and says, these are all the things I have not done. I have not done any of, the, any of these things. Because remember, they've been relentless saying that he has sinned. But offered no proof as to how he has sinned. Now he is systematically going through things that they didn't even bring up just to emphasize. He even says, I didn't even lust after another woman besides my besides my wife. Just in case you were all thinking it but not saying it. Right. Like he goes above and beyond what they even accused him of to say, look, guys, I am I blameless in this thing. I yeah. didn't deserve this. I did nothing wrong. Um, so, okay, Job 22, just a few real quick things. Like I say, we're really not going to look at, at a whole lot because a lot of this is just repeated in different ways. And it's more something that I would – I think you'll get more out of if you yeah. study it on your own, just sit, sitting down and kind of just reading through it slowly. So chapter 22, verse 3, he says, What pleasure would it give the Almighty if you were righteous? What would he gain if your ways were blameless? Basically, what does God gain from us? Like you're you're acting like God has something to gain from you. And see, that's the thing that's, that's surprising about this is we all know that God doesn't gain anything from us. Wow. But yet at the beginning of the book, God was gaining glory because of what Job was doing. That's weird because we, we know that God doesn't need it, but at the same time he was getting something from Job. Which, not to not to compare it to the ancient Near East, I mean they have this whole other idea. You had to feed the gods, for instance. Whole different idea. But Job emphasizes once again, this is an extremely important, that the actions of the individual matter. This is something that's not a big deal to us because America is all about individualism. Right. But back then, the ancient Near East did not believe that the actions of an individual would have some great cosmic change. Verse 4, um, is it for your piety that he rebukes you and brings charges against you? Who punishes uh, good people for doing good? <laughs> so then Job 22-24, Job gives his response. I'm sorry, did you want to take a picture? Like I say, I'm not really going to go too much on, on the specifics because Job is more something that you're spo supposed to read and then think about. Going verse by verse is kind of redundant in a book like this. Um, Job 22 through 24, he gives his response. Even today my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. And an alternate, um, an alternate reading is that he's talking about his friends and not God. Right. In other words, in spite of my groaning, you're still being uh, oppressive to me. Um I don't really – I think either way kind of has a similar meaning, but whatever. Um, this implies that he had, it had been going on for a while. Even today my complaint is bitter. That kind of seems to imply that maybe this was an ongoing uh, thing. Now, I said at the beginning it has to be at least past seven days because seven days was how long it took for um, his, uh, his friends to start talking or for him to start talking and then to respond. And we can probably assume it was longer than that for the co first couple of chapters because – you typically didn't have your, your, your flock and stuff right outside where your tent was. You oh. typically grazed them. Right. So it could even be multiple days away from where he was. Right. So with that being said, I nice. mean, how long would it take for a messenger to run even if he didn't take any breaks? You're still talking about like eight or ten hours of running yeah. with no breaks. I mean, uh, uh, maybe. Um, okay. Um, so verses six through seven. Would he vigorously oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. Now, this is a contrast to what Job has said earlier. Earlier, when he was in that bout of depression, remember he was saying about how God would wouldn't listen because he he didn't really listen to the to the oppressed and he just kind of hated everybody. And would he vigorously oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. There, the upright can establish their innocence before him, and there I would be delivered forever from my judge. So here we have an optimistic Job. 
Um, he's optimistic that God would justify him and be and, be, and he would be restored. Uh, chapter twenty four, verse one. Why does the Almighty not see a set times for judgment? Why must those who know Him look in vain for such days? So he he starts acknowledging the fact that the wicked will suffer, but then he also kind of gives this: if only he would put a time limit on it, like right. your day's coming tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, so Job Job struggled with not having the answers, and I think that that's in, extremely important to notice because how many of you have all of your answers? No. Uh -huh. See what I mean? With Job, we see a lot of things. First off, Job is a type of Christ. He points forward to Jesus in the same way that Jesus literally suffered for doing nothing wrong. He was the epitome of righteous. Right. Not just blameless, but righteous. He was completely justified before God, and he still suffered. So in that way, Job pointed forward to Jesus, who would do even more so suffering than Job would. Um, anyways... Verse 13 of chapter 24. There are those who rebel against the light, who do not know its ways or stay in its path. So here, here we have, who is the light that it can be rebelled against? We have Job mentioning an, a light, but he personifies it. Now, this really would be kind of confusing for a Jewish audience back then. But for a Christian audience, this is less confusing because we have, like, for instance, the Gospel of John, where it says that Jesus is the light. Right. So here we have another reference to the coming Messiah that I honestly don't think Job understood what he was saying. No. I honestly don't. I am convinced that a lot of the prophets didn't understand what they were prophesying either. You don't have to understand everything that God tells you to say. No. <laughs> That's just a way of life. Right. And uh, anyways, so, um, so we have a switch in Job's speech to slightly more optimistic talk. He strengthened himself even though others were trying to weaken him. Have you ever gone through a really hard time and you had to, you had to strengthen yourself just to yeah, face, the, face yeah. the world again? Yeah. He had to strengthen himself while he was constantly being oppressed by his three friends and constantly nagging him. That's tough. Have, I, I don't know about you, but I kind of I have to re revive myself by myself. Right. I, I let myself in my office and just kind of get away from the world. Yes. Job had to revive himself while being torn down. Like that says that's, great that's, things about yeah, his strength was, in God. That was very, that's very tough. So Job chapter 25, very short chapter. It's the last thing that his friends have to say. It is literally five Sorry. verses of talking. Six. No, the first verse doesn't have him talking. Oh, okay, okay. So five verses of talking. Yeah. How like. <laughs> It's almost like Bill Dad doesn't know what to say, so he's like, well, I can't just say nothing. So he says basically the exact same thing. Dominion and all belong to God. Can his forces be numbered? If even the moon is not bright, how much less immortal? You know, basically the same thing over and over again. It's nothing new here, um, but at least it was short. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to say something stupid, at least keep it short. So that takes us to Job's... Job's uh, Job's, uh, I, I, I don't know, like renewed energy. Uh -huh. I, I, my theory is that he just got pissed off. That's my theory. <laughs> yeah. you, you can form your own theory, whatever. Um, verses 2 through 4. How you have helped the powerless. How you have saved the arm that is feeble. What advice you have offered to one without wisdom. And what great insight you have displayed. Who has helped you utter these words? Tell me, whose spirit spoke from your mouth? Like, you can just see the sarcasm. I love how sarcastic he gets in this part. So here we have a turning point of determination for Job. And it appears he actually stopped Zophar from giving a third speech, which says something. It's hard to give such a lengthy and, and, and fervent speech that you literally stop an idiot from saying something. I don't know. Normally when I, when I say something to an idiot, they just keep talking. Right. But Job had this like determination, past determination to shut this guy up, and it worked. Thank God. We might have, we might have a, a, a the book of Job might have had fifty two chapters if this guy would have gone again. Yeah. So in twenty seven seven through eight, which is the next chapter down, um, it says, "May my enemy be like the wicked, my adversary like the unjust. For what hope have the godless when they are cut off, when God takes away their life?" Now, if you noticed. The enemy here has actually included his three friends. It's no longer those people who no. took his camels. It's no longer Satan. It's no longer God as his, as his, as his enemy. It is, it is also his oh. friends here, too, if you've been paying attention to what's being oh, yeah. said. So may my enemy be like the wicked, may my, my adversary be like the unjust. So here we have a switch. He's no longer talking about God as his enemy. And he's kind of seeming to imply that 
something good's gonna happen. I don't know what, but some even if I'm dead, I'm gonna be resurrected to see this good thing happen. And instead of being so, God is is just laughing at, at, at my suffering. He switched, but now he's gotten more focused as to who is actually being his enemy at this point, right. which is a good thing right. because before he was just taking general pot shots at everyone. Right. <laughs> now he's actually right. specifying. These are the people who did me wrong. You guys need to stop. You need to knock it off. Right. So uh, he switches from the prosperity of the wicked. Um, if you remember a couple chapters ago, he was talking about how the wicked prosper and all this stuff. Now we have a slight change in that. Mm -hmm. He's talking about more of the punishment of the wicked that is coming. So that's that's kind of a big development. Yeah. Because remember how long he was talking about how the wicked are, are, yeah. are, are prospering and how nothing is happening to them? So then in chap uh, chapter 28... Is this long, long uh, part about wisdom that really is like it's like a break in thought. Oh. And uh, so then in verse twenty-eight, this is actually something that's repeated in the book of Proverbs, which m brought me to a question that 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 we might want to consider: Is it possible that King Solomon wrote the book of Job? Maybe. I mean, is it is that possible? It, now, obviously, if he did, that would imply that it, the events weren't factual, but they would still teach a very important message. Yes. Now, I've already said that I kind of do believe that the events were factual, so I'm kind of arguing against myself at this right. point. But right. it's, a, it's a possibility we can't ignore. Right. And he, um, and he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. That's like exactly taken from the book of Proverbs. Right. So I don't know if like, they influence each other, if they were written by the same people. If they were written around the same time, I don't know. You don't think that Job could have been his friend and he told him what happened? If yeah. you would date Job that, if you you would date Job's life that late, uh -huh. as to live at the oh, same time as Solomon, then hypothetically, yes. But typically, people uh -huh. date Job the person, not the uh -huh. book, the person to living a long time before that. Uh -huh. So you would have to resolve that issue before you were ever able right. to theorize uh -huh. if. Now, we do know that there were other wise people besides Solomon. The Egypt has lots of different um, wisdom literature. Uh, there are some people mentioned in the Bible that we have no idea who they are You know, in, at the end of the book of Proverbs. Anyways, um, wisdom as pre-existent thing that God gives, once again, exactly – this has been talked about in, in the book of John, for instance. So this is contrast with, with what, the, what the friends said about wisdom. If you remember, his friends were like – were you going to take a picture? Okay. His friends were all like about how basically if you're stupid, you're stupid. There's nothing you can do to fix it. And here he's talking about how wisdom is attainable. So that's clearly a contrast to what they were saying. Um, and don't don't miss the, the the jabs that Job is, is definitely throwing at his three friends. Read through what this friend said again and then read through what he says here in chapters uh, 27, 26 to 31. Yeah. And you'll see that he's – I mean, he's saying some clear jabs there, yeah. um, which I think I might be saying stuff like that if I was this irritated with these people, well, I think. Right. So in Job chapter 29 to 31, this is Job's final, you know, this is all that I had to say left. You know, right. you guys are right. just right. not listening, so let me just kind of make this absolutely abundantly clear. Um, he talks about how things used to be in chapter 29 uh -huh. and chapter 30, uh, verse 1 through 23, he talks about how things are. But now they mock me, men younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to put with my sheepdogs. In other words, he has no respect. People don't look up to him. And in fact, in chapter 29, he talks about the different people who look up to him. Um, I thought I will die in my own house. My days as numerous as the grains of sand. Things are going to be okay with for me. I'm going to have an easy life. But now they mock me. So then we get to um, verses 24 all the way into chapter 31, verse 40. He systematically defends... That he had done nothing wrong. And he goes through all kinds of different things I just summarized here. He didn't ignore the poor and distressed. He didn't lust. He didn't cheat or lie. He didn't act sinfully. He didn't act unjustly. He put trust. He did not put trust in well. Sorry, I said that backwards. He didn't worship idols or anything else as God. He didn't curse others. He didn't even curse people who wronged him. Wow. How many times has somebody irritated you and just said, God, would you just get after him? Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And he didn't even waste his time with that. Like, that says loads about his characters. Right. He didn't reject homeless or the tra or travelers. He didn't sin against the earth. Oh. He even says that he didn't do something to sin against the earth. Guys, that means that all of his crops, for instance, he paid tithes on. 
That means that, that that he didn't shed innocent blood. That there, right. like for instance, when 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 Cain killed Abel, the the earth testified against him. He was saying literally, the earth has nothing to testify against me. Right. Which goes back to what he said about about the redeemer standing on the earth, which was his grave. Remember that? Uh -huh. I'm going to die, but my redeemer will be there to vindicate me. Standing on the ground of the innocence. That's his point. The ground that cannot testify against me because I didn't do anything wrong. All right. So we have here the frustrated cry of a man, I didn't do these things. It. Have you ever had a parent that constantly uh, said that you did something you didn't do? Are you mad? What? You're mad. Are you mad? You're mad? It's like, I am now. <laughs> uh. But anyways, and so here we have Job's, you know, it's just complete irritation with the situation. And with that, the three friends step <coughs> out of the limelight. They're not mentioned again until the very end of the book. And Job even takes a secondary role for the rest of the book. The rest of the book uh, circles around two main people. Uh, one whose name is um, something with an E. I forget what his name is. Elihu. Elihu, yes. Elihu. And then it switches to God. Job has two very short things that he says. The first is even shorter than the second. Um, and then uh, that's it. The friends don't talk anymore. The wife doesn't talk anymore. Right. Uh, nothing. The only thing the wife is recorded as saying is curse God and die. That's the only That's thing it. she has to say in the whole book. That's and it. if you notice, when he's out there mourning and, and weeping and, and having a heck of a hard time with these three friends, she's nowhere to be found. No. Like, she literally is no help. And I honestly believe that Satan left her there on purpose. <laughs> like, I am convinced that Satan left her, left her there as a thorn in the flesh. I, I just imagine uh -huh. her, like, all irritated in the house, like, washing dishes all... It's like, why don't you just uh, get up? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, and I'm married, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, but anyways, any questions about that? I know we kind of went through it quick. I didn't really feel the need to postpone something no. that we already kind of covered. Yeah. So, yeah. If you didn't read, if you aren't going to read uh, Job through this month, please do still read chapters 26 through 31 because those are just so important. So important.